section forty of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six by various authors section forty moral versus intellectual principles in human progress from the history of civilization in england by henry thomas buckle eighteen twenty one through eighteen sixty two henry thomas buckle was born at lee in kent on november twenty fourth eighteen twenty one the son of a wealthy london merchant a delicate child he participated in none of the ordinary sports of children but sat instead for hours listening to his mother's reading of the bible and the arabian nights she had a great influence on his early development she was a calvinist deeply religious and buckle himself in after years acknowledged that to her he owed his faith in human progress through the dissemination and triumph of truth as well as his taste for philosophic speculations and his love for poetry his devotion to her was lifelong owing to his feeble health he passed but a few years at school and did not enter college nor did he know much in the scholar's sense of books till he was nearly eighteen the arabian nights the pilgrim's progress and shakespeare constituted his chief reading but he was fond of games of mental skill and curiously enough first gained distinction not in letters but at the chessboard and in the course of his subsequent travels he challenged and defeated the champions of europe he was concerned for a short time in business but being left with an independent income after the death of his father he resolved to devote himself to study he travelled for a year on the continent learning on the spot the languages of the countries he passed through in time he became an accomplished linguist reading nineteen languages and conversing fluently in seven by the time he was nineteen he had resolved to write a great historic work of a nature not yet attempted by any one to prepare himself for this monumental labor and to make up for past deficiencies he settled in london and apparently single-handed and without the advice or help of tutors or professional men entered upon that course of voluminous reading on which his erudition rests he is a singular instance of a self-taught man without scientific or academic training producing a work that marks an epoch in historical literature with a wonderful memory he had like macaulay the gift of getting the meaning and value of a book by simply glancing over the pages on an average he could read with intelligent comprehension three books in a working day of eight hours and in time mastered his library of twenty two thousand volumes indexing every book on the back and transcribing many pages into his commonplace books in this way he spent fifteen years of study in collecting his materials the first volume of his introduction to the history of civilization in england appeared in eighteen fifty seven and aroused an extraordinary interest because of the novelty and audacity of its statements it was both bitterly attacked and enthusiastically praised as it antagonized or attracted its readers buckle became the intellectual hero of the hour the second volume appeared in may eighteen sixty one and now worn out by overwork his delicate nerves completely unstrung by the death of his mother who had remained his first and only love he left england for the east in company with the two young sons of a friend in palestine he was stricken with typhoid fever and died at damascus on may twenty ninth eighteen sixty two his grave is marked by a marble tomb with the inscription from the arabic the written word remains long after the writer the writer is resting under the earth but his works endure three volumes of miscellanies and posthumous works edited by helen taylor were published in eighteen seventy two among these are a lecture on women delivered before the royal institution buckle's single and very successful attempt at public speaking and a review of mill's liberty one of the finest contemporary appreciations of that thinker 
but he wrote little outside his history devoting himself with entire singleness of purpose to his life work the introduction to the history of civilization in england has been aptly called the fragment of a fragment when as a mere youth he outlined his work he overestimated the extremest accomplishment of a single mind and did not clearly comprehend the vastness of the undertaking he had planned a general history of civilization but as the material increased on his hands he was forced to limit his project and finally decided to confine his work to a consideration of england from the middle of the sixteenth century in february eighteen fifty three he wrote to a friend quote, i have been long convinced that the progress of every people is regulated by principles or as they are called laws as regular and as certain as those which govern the physical world to discover these laws is the object of my work i propose to take a general survey of the moral intellectual and legislative peculiarities of the great countries of europe and i hope to point out the circumstances under which these peculiarities have risen this will lead to a perception of certain relations between the various stages through which each people have progressively passed of these general relations i intend to make a particular application and by a careful analysis of the history of england to show how they have regulated our civilization and how the successive and apparently the arbitrary forms of our opinions our literature our laws and our manners have naturally grown out of their antecedents End quote this general scheme was adhered to in the published history and he supported his views by a vast array of illustrations and proofs the main ideas advanced in the introduction for he did not live to write the body of the work the future volumes to which he often pathetically refers these ideas may be thus stated first nothing had yet been done toward discovering the principles underlying the character and destiny of nations to establish a basis for a science of history a task which buckle proposed to himself second experience shows that nations are governed by laws as fixed and regular as the laws of the physical world third climate soil food and the aspects of nature are the primary causes in forming the character of a nation fourth the civilization within and without europe is determined by the fact that in europe man is stronger than nature and here alone has subdued her to his service whereas on the other continents nature is the stronger and man has been subdued by her fifth the continually increasing influence of mental laws and the continually diminishing influence of physical laws characterize the advance of european civilization sixth the mental laws regulating the progress of society can only be discovered by such a comprehensive survey of facts as will enable us to eliminate disturbances namely by the method of averages seventh human progress is due to intellectual activity which continually changes and expands rather than to moral agencies which from the beginnings of society have been more or less stationary eighth in human affairs in general individual efforts are insignificant the great men work for evil rather than for good and are moreover merely incidental to their age ninth religion literature art and government instead of being causes of civilization are merely its products tenth the progress of civilization varies directly as skepticism the disposition to doubt or the protective spirit the disposition to maintain without examination established beliefs and practices predominates the new scientific method of darwin and mill were just then being eagerly discussed in england and buckle an alert student and great admirer of mill in touch with the new movements of the day proposed quote, by adapting to the history of man those methods of investigation which have been found successful in other branches of knowledge and rejecting all preconceived notions which could not bear the test of those methods end quote to remove history from the condemnation of being a mere series of arbitrary facts or a biography of famous men or the small beer chronicle of court gossip and intrigues and to raise it to the level of an exact science subject to mental laws as rigid and infallible as the laws of nature 
quote. Instead of telling us of those things which alone have any value, instead of giving us information respecting the progress of knowledge and the way in which mankind has been affected by the diffusion of that knowledge, the vast majority of historians fill their works with the most trifling and miserable details. In other great branches of knowledge, observation has preceded discovery. First the facts have been registered, and then their laws have been found. But in the study of the history of man, the important facts have been neglected, and the unimportant ones preserved. The consequence is that whoever now attempts to generalize historical phenomena must collect the facts as well as conduct the generalization. End quote. Buckle's ideal of the office and acquirements of the historian was of the highest. He must indeed possess a synthesis of the whole range of human knowledge to explain the progress of man. By connecting history with political economy and statistics, he strove to make it exact. And he exemplified his theories by taking up branches of scientific investigation hitherto considered entirely outside the province of the historian. He first wrote history scientifically, pursuing the same methods and using the same kinds of proofs as the scientific worker. The first volume excited as much angry discussion as Darwin's Origin of Species had done in its day. The boldness of its generalizations, its uncompromising and dogmatic tone, irritated more than one class of readers. The chapters on Spain and on Scotland, with their strictures on the religions of those countries, containing some of the most brilliant passages in the book, brought up in arms against him both Catholics and Presbyterians. Trained scientists blame him for encroaching on their domains with an insufficient knowledge of the phenomena of the natural world, whence resulted a defective logic and vague generalizations. It is true that Buckle was not trained in the methods of the schools, that he labored under the disadvantage of a self-taught solitary worker, not receiving the friction of other vigorous minds, and that his reading, if extensive, was not always wisely chosen, and from its very amount often ill-digested. He had knowledge rather than true learning, and taking this knowledge at second hand often relied on sources that proved either untrustworthy or antiquated, for he lacked the true relator's fine discrimination that weighs and sifts authorities and rejects the inadequate. Malicious critics declared that all was grist that came to his mill. Yet his popularity with that class of readers whom he did not shock by his disquisitions on religions and morals, or make distrustful by his sweeping generalizations and scientific inaccuracies, is due to the fact that his book appeared at the right moment, for the time was really come to make history something more than a chronicle of detached facts and antidotes. The scientific spirit was awake and demanded that human action like the processes of nature be made the subject of general law the mind of buckle proved fruitful soil for those germs of thought floating in the air and he gave them visible form in his history if he was not a leader he was a brilliant formulator of thought and he was the first to put before the reading world then ready to receive them ideas and speculations till now belonging to the student for he wrote with the determination to be intelligible to the general reader. It detracts nothing from the permanent value of his work thus to state its genesis, for this is merely to apply to it his own methods. Moreover, a perpetual charm lies in his clear, limpid English, a medium perfectly adapted to calm exposition or to impassioned rhetoric. Whatever the defects of Buckle's system, whatever the inaccuracies that the advance of thirty years of patient scientific labors can easily point out, however sweeping his generalization, or however dogmatic his assertions, the book must be allowed high rank among the works that set men thinking, and must thus be conceded to possess enduring value. Now this excerpt from Buckle's History of Civilization in England Moral versus Intellectual Principles in Human Progress There is unquestionably nothing to be found in the world which has undergone so little change as those great dogmas of which moral systems are composed. To do good to others, to sacrifice for their benefit your own wishes, to love your neighbor as yourself, to forgive your enemies, to restrain your passions, 
to honor your parents to respect those who are set over you these and a few others are the sole essentials of morals but they have been known for thousands of years and not one jot or tittle has been added to them by all the sermons homilies and textbooks which moralists and theologians have been able to produce but if we contrast this stationary aspect of moral truths with the progressive aspect of intellectual truths the difference is indeed startling all the great moral systems which have exercised much influence have been fundamentally the same all the great intellectual systems have been fundamentally different in reference to our moral conduct there is not a single principle now known to the most cultivated europeans which was not likewise known to the ancients in reference to the conduct of our intellect the moderns have not only made the most important additions to every department of knowledge that the ancients ever attempted to study but besides this they have upset and revolutionized the old methods of inquiry they have consolidated into one great scheme all those resources of induction which aristotle alone dimly perceived and they have created sciences the faintest idea of which never entered the mind of the boldest thinker antiquity produced these are to every educated man recognized and notorious facts and the inference to be drawn from them is immediately obvious since civilization is the product of moral and intellectual agencies and since that product is constantly changing it evidently cannot be regulated by the stationary agent because when surrounding circumstances are unchanged a stationary agent can only produce a stationary effect the only other agent is the intellectual one and that this is the real mover may be proved in two distinct ways first because being as we have already seen either moral or intellectual and being as we have also seen not moral it must be intellectual and secondly because the intellectual principle has an activity and a capacity for adaptation which as i undertake to show is quite sufficient to account for the extraordinary progress that during several centuries europe has continued to make such are the main arguments by which my view is supported but there are also other and collateral circumstances which are well worthy of consideration the first is that the intellectual principle is not only far more progressive than the moral principle but is also far more permanent in its results the acquisitions made by the intellect are in every civilized country carefully preserved registered in certain well understood formulas and protected by the use of technical and scientific language they are easily handed down from one generation to another and thus assuming an accessible or as it were a tangible form they often influence the most distant posterity they become the heirlooms of mankind the immortal bequest of the genius to which they owe their birth but the good deeds affected by our moral faculties are less capable of transmission they are of a more private and retiring character while as the motives to which they owe their origin are generally the result of self-discipline and of self-sacrifice they have to be worked out by every man for himself and thus begun by each anew they derive little benefit from the maxims of preceding experience nor can they well be stored up for the use of future moralists the consequence is that although moral excellence is more amiable and to most persons more attractive than intellectual excellence still it must be confessed that looking at ulterior results it is far less active less permanent and as i shall presently prove less productive of real good indeed if we examine the effects of the most active philanthropy and of the largest and most disinterested kindness we shall find that those effects are comparatively speaking short-lived that there is only a small number of individuals they come in contact with and benefit that they rarely survive the generation which witnessed their commencement and that when they take the more durable form of founding great public charities such institutions invariably fall first into abuse then into decay and after a time are either destroyed or perverted from their original intention mocking the effort by which it is vainly attempted to perpetuate the memory even of the purest and most energetic benevolence 
these conclusions are no doubt very unpalatable and what makes them peculiarly offensive is that it is impossible to refute them for the deeper we penetrate into this question the more clearly shall we see the superiority of intellectual acquisitions over moral feeling there is no instance on record of an ignorant man who having good intentions and supreme power to enforce them has not done far more evil than good and whenever the intentions have been very eager and the power very extensive the evil has been enormous but if you can diminish the sincerity of that man if you can mix some alloy with his motives you will likewise diminish the evil which he works if he is selfish as well as ignorant it will often happen that you may play off his vice against his ignorance and by exciting his fears restrain his mischief if however he has no fear if he is entirely unselfish if his sole object is the good of others if he pursues that object with enthusiasm upon a large scale with a disinterested zeal then it is that you have no check upon him you have no means of preventing the calamities which in an ignorant age an ignorant man will be sure to inflict how entirely this is verified by experience we may see in studying the history of religious persecution to punish even a single man for his religious tenets is assuredly a crime of the deepest dye but to punish a large body of men to persecute an entire sect to attempt to extirpate opinions which growing out of the state of society in which they arise are themselves a manifestation of the marvellous and luxuriant fertility of the human mind to do this is not only one of the most pernicious but one of the most foolish acts that can possibly be conceived nevertheless it is an undoubted fact that an overwhelming majority of religious persecutors have been men of the purest intentions of the most admirable and unsullied morals it is impossible that this should be otherwise for they are not bad-intentioned men who seek to enforce opinions which they believe to be good still less are they bad men who are so regardless of temporal considerations as to employ all the resources of their power not for their own benefit but for the purpose of propagating a religion which they think necessary to the future happiness of mankind such men as these are not bad they are only ignorant ignorant of the nature of truth ignorant of the consequences of their own acts but in a moral point of view their motives are unimpeachable indeed it is the very ardor of their sincerity which warms them into persecution it is the holy zeal by which they are fired that quickens their fanaticism into a deadly activity if you can impress any man with an absorbing conviction of the supreme importance of some moral or religious doctrine if you can make him believe that those who reject that doctrine are doomed to eternal perdition if you then give that man power and by means of his ignorance blind him to the ulterior consequences of his own act he will infallibly persecute those who deny his doctrine and the extent of his persecution will be regulated by the extent of his sincerity diminish the sincerity and you will diminish the persecution in other words by weakening the virtue you may check the evil this is a truth of which history furnishes such innumerable examples that to deny it would be not only to reject the plainest and most conclusive arguments but to refuse the concurrent testimony of every age i will merely select two cases which from the entire difference in their circumstances are very apposite as illustrations the first being from the history of paganism the other from the history of christianity and both proving the inability of moral feeling to control religious persecution one the roman emperors as is well known subjected the early christians to persecutions which though they have been exaggerated were frequent and very grievous but what to some persons must appear extremely strange is that among the active authors of these cruelties we find the names of the best men who ever sat on the throne while the worst and most infamous princes were precisely those who spared the christians and took no heed of their increase the two most thoroughly depraved of all the emperors were certainly commodus and elagabalus neither of whom persecuted the new religion or indeed adopted any measures against it 
they were too reckless of the future too selfish too absorbed in their own infamous pleasures to mind whether truth or error prevailed and being thus indifferent to the welfare of their subjects they cared nothing about the progress of a creed which they as pagan emperors were bound to regard as a fatal and impious delusion they therefore allowed christianity to run its course unchecked by those penal laws which more honest but more mistaken rulers would assuredly have enacted we find accordingly that the great enemy of christianity was marcus aurelius a man of kindly temper and of fearless unflinching honesty but whose reign was characterized by a persecution from which he would have refrained had he been less in earnest about the religion of his fathers and to complete the argument it may be added that the last and one of the most strenuous opponents of christianity who occupied the throne of the caesars was julian a prince of eminent probity whose opinions are often attacked but against whose moral conduct even calumny itself has hardly breathed a suspicion two the second illustration is supplied by spain a country of which it must be confessed that in no other have religious feelings exercised such sway over the affairs of men no other european nation has produced so many ardent and disinterested missionaries zealous self-denying martyrs who have cheerfully sacrificed their lives in order to propagate truths which they thought necessary to be known nowhere else have the spiritual classes been so long in the ascendant nowhere else are the people so devout the churches so crowded the clergy so numerous but the sincerity and honesty of purpose by which the spanish people taken as a whole have always been marked have not only been unable to prevent religious persecution but have proved the means of encouraging it if the nation had been more lukewarm it would have been more tolerant as it was the preservation of the faith became the first consideration and everything being sacrificed to this one object it naturally happened that zeal begat cruelty and the soil was prepared in which the inquisition took root and flourished the supporters of that barbarous institution were not hypocrites but enthusiasts hypocrites are for the most part too subtle to be cruel for cruelty is a stern and unbending passion while hypocrisy is a fawning and flexible art which accommodates itself to human feelings and flatters the weakness of men in order that it may gain its own ends in spain the earnestness of the nation being concentrated on a single topic carried everything before it and hatred of heresy becoming a habit persecution of heresy was thought a duty the conscientious energy with which that duty was fulfilled is seen in the history of the spanish church indeed that the inquisitors were remarkable for an undeviating and uncorruptible integrity may be proved in a variety of ways and from different and independent sources of evidence this is a question to which i shall hereafter return but there are two testimonies which i cannot omit because from the circumstances attending them they are peculiarly unimpeachable laurent the great historian of the inquisition and its bitter enemy had access to its private papers and yet with the fullest means of information he does not even insinuate a charge against the moral character of the inquisitors but while execrating the cruelty of their conduct he cannot deny the purity of their intentions thirty years earlier townsend a clergyman of the church of england published his valuable work on spain and though as a protestant and an englishman he had every reason to be prejudiced against the infamous system which he describes he also can bring no charge against those who upheld it but having occasion to mention its establishment at barcelona one of its most important branches he makes the remarkable admission that all its members are men of worth and that most of them are of distinguished humanity these facts startling as they are form a very small part of that vast mass of evidence which history contains and which decisively proves the utter inability of moral feelings to diminish religious persecution the way in which the diminution has been really affected by the mere progress of intellectual acquirements will be pointed out in another part of this volume when we shall see that the great antagonist of intolerance is not humanity but knowledge 
it is to the diffusion of knowledge and to that alone that we owe the comparative cessation of what is unquestionably the greatest evil men have ever inflicted on their own species for that religious persecution is a greater evil than any other is apparent not so much from the enormous and almost incredible number of its known victims as from the fact that the unknown must be far more numerous and that history gives no account of those who have been spared in the body in order that they might suffer in the mind we hear much of martyrs and confessors of those who were slain by the sword or consumed in the fire but we know little of that still larger number who by the mere threat of persecution have been driven into an outward abandonment of their real opinions and who thus forced into an apostasy the heart abhors have passed the remainder of their lives in the practice of a constant and humiliating hypocrisy it is this which is the real curse of religious persecution for in this way men being constrained to mask their thoughts there arises a habit of securing safety by falsehood and of purchasing impunity with deceit in this way fraud becomes a necessary of life insincerity is made a daily custom the whole tone of public feeling is vitiated and the gross amount of vice and of error fearfully increased surely then we have reason to say that compared to all this all other crimes are of small account and we may well be grateful for that increase of intellectual pursuits which has destroyed an evil that some among us would even now willingly restore end of section forty